So yeah, actually, you know, we said um, make you know, make uh, the academy fun again. Um, I hope that I hope that none of you are turned off by the fact that this seems to mean very erudite philosophical humor with you know jokes about Marx. Uh, but if that's what it is, that would be a lot better than what we have now. Um, so John, so you, you you told people a little bit about the campus communities initiative. Um, in a lot of our conversations, you've talked so much about how um, we, we just, you know, we haven't, we haven't asked enough of our members, we haven't given them enough, uh, that, or at least that there's a lot more that you saw. You came in and you saw that there's a lot more that we, that we could do. So do you have any further thoughts? The campus communities you've already explained, are there any further thoughts about what we'll be, what we'll be doing? Yeah, I guess I'll, I'll just say that um, one of the things that really struck me when I took this job in January and started listening in more closely, because now I'm not just a casual listener, but someone who has to listen and make decisions, one of the things that most struck me was that so many members said to me, well, what else can we do? There's a, there seemed to be sort of a, uh, uh, an end of the road we'd find when people would think about our ideas or express their ideals, but then what beyond expressing our ideals was there to do? And that really interested me. And I've been studying, um, I've been studying various different groups who, try to, have been, who, who are being effective at making changes on campus. DEI is one of the main groups I've been studying in various ways, seeing how they think about making institutional changes, not just, not just changing hearts and minds or making campus statements, but actually moving institutions to, in, on behalf of certain values. I think there's an analog, perhaps, for HXA, thinking strategically, thinking about institutional growth and institutional development. I can imagine small things when we start these communities in the fall, um, very small things, just, just beginning to meet to know each other. As you may know, membership wasn't even public until fairly recently. Now that you know who each other are, it seems like a natural step to bring you together so you actually meet each other. And once you start meeting each other, then there's all kinds of things you can start doing with one another. You can decide individually to have your, to put new language on your syllabi. Think about the way you change your classes. You can start next level bringing, bringing ideas to your department. You can start getting involved in committees that make choices about which, 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 which books freshmen read when they come in. There's a whole range of things we can start doing once you start thinking about it that can make the world more safe, make, make your campus more safe for HXA values. Um, I can say more, but John and I agree we're going we're gonna to flip some questions, and I, I, and I, one I really want to ask him. Okay. Is that okay? Yep. Go so um, I, I, think I, I think I first, I've known John for a long time, but I, I think the first piece of his I've ever read um, was The Happiness Hypothesis, which I think was around 2005 or six. Um, which I thought, what an optimistic, happy <laughs> book. <laughs> and more recently, he was in my, uh, at my apartment in New York and uh, showing me a draft of this thing he'd written, which came out a little came out recently called um, After Babel, <laughs> which I read after he left. And I thought to myself, man, this guy's gotten dark. <laughs> <laughs> so, my question, so my question to John is, um, has your worldview changed? Do you, see, do you see darkness? What, what do you see now? Yeah. <laughs> so I thought we were going to make this really optimistic and hopeful here. But, um, so, right, so my first book, The Happiness Hypothesis, I was, um, I was very active in positive psychology. And it's a book about ancient wisdom and, and you know, what the ancients knew about human flourishing and relationships. They knew nothing about physics and chemistry. You can throw that all out. But if you want to understand consciousness and human relationships, you can't find anything better in the world than the Stoics and the Buddhists. Um, so it was a very hopeful book about how to flourish. And that was you know, written in the early 2000s. Um, and then I wrote The Righteous Mind, which is a little darker. Um, and that's about the culture war that was already really scaling up uh, in the late 2000s. And then I wrote The Coddling of the American Mind, which was about how we were kind of going over a cliff and Gen Z is possibly a lost generation and, um, but we end, but Greg and I tried very hard to end that book with hope. And so we found uh, about six or eight green shoots to talk about, and they were really things that were happening. And now all of them are dead. Um, <laughs> and then, and then I wrote Life After Babel, which is about how we're all basically wandering in the plain of Shinar, unable to speak to each other in the wreckage. So yes, my views have changed. <laughs> now, Actually, you know, so how many of you saw that horrible TV show, uh, Don't Look Up? You see that? Okay. So, so the way I think about myself now, I, I am the sociological version of Don't Look Up. That is, we are headed, you know, we have like an asteroid heading, at least if you're in the United States, 
we have an international audience here, but most people from the United States. Um, I think we have a sociological asteroid heading towards us um, because it's very hard to have a functioning democracy without anything to tie it together. And for a variety of reasons that I talk about in the essay, I think we are really at risk of coming apart. Um, and that's why it's so important that we get our institutions working. The whole point of the Babel piece was don't focus on your enemies, don't focus on people, focus on institutions because if we, we have epistemic institutions, those that give us knowledge and understanding and truth, and that includes universities preeminently, but also journalism, the courts, all the things that Jonathan Rauch talks about in his wonderful book, The Constitution of Knowledge. We have epistemic institutions and we have democratic institutions. And if all of those are now malfunctioning compared to how they were 10 or 20 years ago, then we're not gonna make it as a country. And that's the don't look up analogy. I think there is a risk of really catastrophic political collapse. Now, um, on to a slightly more hopeful note. Um, I, um, I ma maintain my sanity and I'm, and I'm actually even really excited about, about where things are. I mean, one metaphor I use is like, I'm like a shipwreck expert that got the last ticket on the Titanic and I'm so excited for what's gonna happen. Um, <laughs> But another way to think about it is that there are, there are cycles in history. And there are all these theories, going back to ancient Greece, there's Ibn Khaldun, a Muslim theorist in the 14th century, there's Strauss and House, there's Peter Turchin. All these theorists have noticed that societies go in these cycles, often about 80 to 100, 80 to 100 year cycles. They're sort of generational. And you can't go up and up forever. Steve Pinker is right that overall things get better. And if you look at our material progress, it's incredible. But if you look at our sociological, social, cohesion, trust, all those sociological variables, they really do go up and down. And many of us had the joy of living through the 90s, which was really the best decade in a very long time. Peace broke out, so many good things were happening. But guess what? That can't last, at least not for our species on this planet. And so we, are, we find ourselves in the position that many of our grandparents did in the 1930s, let's say, where after an amazing decade in the 20s, things looked a lot darker. But guess what? They made it through. And they made it through because they put their shoulder to the, to the, to the wheel or whatever the metaphor is, and they, and they worked. And they, um, this is the thing that de Tocqueville observed about Americans, that in Europe, he, he observed that wherever you find a problem in America, that in Europe, people would wait for the king or the nobles. In America, people form an association, and they start working on it. Like this one. Like this one like Heterodox Academy, and I have to say, outside in that hallway there, that is an incredible group of organizations. It's like every, like, you know, I, I don't want to list them all, but just, you know, like FIRE and Open Mind and ACTA and, uh, um, uh, um, and Fair for All and AFA and uh, Bridge USA. I mean, those are, these are all amazing organizations, and we all work together. There's no feeling of competition. We all, we're like total Tocquevillians, all of us, and we're all working together. So, um, so you ask what gives me hope, it's that I have very low expectations for, for, for what human life ought to be, and we're living above that design constraint, and yeah, now things are going down, but they're gonna come up eventually, and they're gonna come up because people like us do something about it. So I'm as engaged as I could possibly be, and I'm actually kind of excited for the future. Can I ask you another question? I'm gonna skip, <laughs> I'm gonna skip, but I, I, I wanna, I wanna um, I wonder if some of you, like me, when you, I guess most of you read um, After Babel, right? And I wonder if some of you, like me, wondered precisely how After Babel leads to HXA in the universities. And I'll just share one thought about that that might just raise the, raise the question. And I'll say a couple things and I'll give it to John. So one, one way to read that, that essay is that it's a story of, fractur of fracturing. Mirrors are broken. Stories, stories are no longer shared, shared. We're dispersed all over the place, not just between parties, but also within parties as well. This is a, a main line of that, of, that, of, that, of that article. If you think about it from an HXA's perspective, HXA is advocating greater diversity of thought. So there's at least one level, they'll call it level one, where after Babel sounds like something HXA would kind of be in favor of. More, more viewpoints, more, view, more diversity. John Stuart Mill would say, hey, lost more viewpoints in the, in the world. 
And I, so that's one thought. And then I just want to add a second one and have you invite you to think and comment about it. I sort of think when I read that piece and think about the problem that John's working on, that fracturing is one part of the problem. But there's a second part of the problem that's close to And John, it's in this article too, I think. And that's something about trivialization. It's not just that we're being fractured and separated. It's that we're being made, our lives are being more, made more trivial. And now for the universities, in universities and students, if they stop reading Huckleberry Finn, if they read a Hamlet and are talking about the exclusion of certain uh, women, let's say, or some people, serious issues about Hamlet, but they don't actually get to think in a serious way about who Hamlet was or why he couldn't decide. With they read about Lady Macbeth, and they don't really get a chance to think about why that blood was on her finger bothered her so much when she seemed so eager to put it there earlier in the play. Those deep questions, right? And there's all, you know, them all across all the different fields. But it's trivialization that is really the story of Babel. And the last thing I'll say is this. Think about the story of Babel. It's not just a story of separation, because God could have separated people by making them all blind or perhaps deaf. What he took away from them was the ability to speak and reason. That is, he took away from them the ability to engage in non-trivial things, to do the kind of deep work that we hope happens at universities. So that's a, that's a question and a suggestion. How, the, the, the real question is, can you link the after Babel phenomenon to universities? Mm -hmm. And is trivialization part of the answer, or how do you, how do you think of it? Sure. So um, if you simply put people together and expect them that, that talking is going to lead anywhere, um, that's foolish. Because you, you have to see, we, you know, we evolved for intergroup conflict. We evolved for a certain kind of, of, of animistic worship. Um, where these, where the, these kind of primitive primates that have developed institutions and ways of living that have brought us much more, much higher levels of advanced thinking, much greater levels of tolerance, um, and when you put people together who are different, if the conditions are right, what you get is magic, and if the conditions are wrong, what you get is is stupid, needless conflict. And so here's the worst possible way to put people together. Let's put people together who are different, whether it be by ideology or belief or race or gender. Let's put people together who are different, where they have no shared past, no shared future, no anticipation of being together in the future. It's just for this moment. And some of them are anonymous. You don't even know. Um, and uh, their interactions are limited to 240 characters or other bits of text. <laughs> and it's sequential. It's not live, like where we get to use our, our, our evolved human abilities to connect. So. Um, Let's design the worst possible environment to have people come together. Oh, and let's have all interactions take place in the center of the Roman Forum, the Roman uh, Colosseum, where the stands are full of people who paid to see blood. They do not want to see the gladiators work it out. <laughs> okay, so that is what social media has done for us. It has given us the worst possible way to have human beings interact. And what do we do? And I have that quote from, that incredible quote from James Madison uh, from Federalist 10, where he talks about, you know, where there are no real differences, the, the, triv the most trivial things have been sufficient to incite their most violent passions. Um, and I see so many academics who are on Twitter, and it is such a waste of good minds. So many who just, you know. So, yeah. I mean, to, you know, look, Twitter is incredibly useful to find things to read, and it's good for praising people. So, look, I'm on Twitter. I, I post very little, but I post, you know, once or twice a day. But I try never to <laughs> do what I say, not what I do. No, but, 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 no, but, but seriously, it's, it's not putting out information or pointing to people's good work that's the problem. It's opining and then engaging. Twitter is the worst place to engage. It's a good place to, act, to you know, microblogging, but it's a terrible place to engage. So I try never to get into debates or arguments. If there's a need to argue, I'll email someone privately. There's no point in giving Twitter what it wants, which is gladiators fighting in the ring. Just, so I urge you, don't be part of that. I'm not saying you have to get off Twitter. I'm saying don't be part of that. And if you have friends who are wasting so much of their time and energy, Greg Lukianoff, on Twitter, <laughs> then do an intervention. Do an intervention. Say, Greg, you're too important to be spending this much of your consciousness on Twitter.
but, but, sorry, but I, wa I, want to, um, I want to push you back to the universities. So can you just say more? I mean, so I, I, I have a hy hypothesis on the, on, the, on the table of sorts, I suppose, that one of the dangers we're facing, one of the challenges we face in the face of wokeness is something like the trivialization of our culture in part because students go to campuses, as many of you know, those of us who teach know, and the, there's a real danger, a present danger, that they're not going to encounter the most important parts of these classic te texts. They're going to encounter very likely important parts that have been left out, and that's an important part of our development and growth as scholars, without any question at all. American history is a great example of that, in my opinion. And yet, if you're not reading Madison himself, if you're not taking Locke seriously as a precursor to Thomas Jefferson, and you don't know those ideas, your understanding of history is thin and trivial. And I'm worried that we're raising a generation of people who just don't think deep thoughts. I'm not sure we can connect to Babel or not, but I just, can you, um, you, can you help me make any, any, mm -hmm. any bridge there to that, oh, yes. that concept? Yes, no, absolutely. What does it say I, about us in HXA? So, yeah, okay, so I, I read a, a, a book I strongly recommend to everyone in this room um, called Deep Work by Cal Newport. Uh, it's so useful, um, and you really come to see that our, to create anything worthwhile, you need large blocks of time, you need to think deeply. But when you keep getting interrupted by texts, emails, er, everything, you know, it takes a while to recover after that. And as a result, many of us live almost all of our lives in the shallows, where we, we're like a, an air traffic controller, we're routing things and nothing gets done. At the end of the day, you think, I've done nothing. Um, so all of us, especially academics, who really need blocks, of, large blocks of time, um, our consciousness, our attention is, is being siphoned away. Um, and so it's, 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 we can either live life in the shallows in which we accomplish nothing deep and there's lots of little conflicts, or we can step back from that and we can do deep work, we can think deeply, um, and we can create works that, that matter, that, that survive us, that go out and create value for the world. That's what we need to be doing as academics, is we need to be creating value for the world, not fighting our little fights. That's why it's so, it saddens me, it saddens me that it's a term of, of a program to say, oh, that's, you know, that's purely academic, because we've made it, we have a long history of making things trivial, but it's much worse now. So anyway, what I'm saying is, um, Madison knew that the forces in democracy push us to triviality, and those forces got worse in the age of television. There was lots of writing about that in the 70s and 80s, and it's getting worse now in the age of social media. So we all have to make a deliberate effort to push back, to live differently, um, and to guard our time, to do deep work, and to train our students and our own children. It, I look at my children, and you know, I keep them off of social media, um, but they've got these ever-present devices, um, we have a real crisis of cognitive development in this country, and so we have to be thinking about this at all stages, from elementary school through university and even graduate school. Um, I'm getting a, oh, sorry, I'm getting a signal from um, I'm getting a signal yeah. from Kyle to uh, yeah. move on to the next okay. stage. But can I can I just close with one quote because I remember there is okay because. Yeah, because the, the reason I'm close with the quote is, you know, when I get going on things, you know, I, I, I am very dark about the big picture. Um, and, um, but, there is, but there is a quote that really has, has helped me, and, I, and I, I'd like to end this segment with this quote. It really is a guide for, for how to live, and it comes from, uh, from Joseph Campbell, who was a famous mythologist. He was the, probably the greatest student of, myth, of myths in the 20th century, and he taught at, um, was it Vassar, I think? Um, one of those schools. And um, so he wrote a book called The Hero's Journey, and he was interviewed, I saw this when I was a, a young man, I saw this series on PBS, he was interviewed about The Hero's Journey and, and all his work, and he, and, he, and he said the lesson of it, the lesson of The Hero's Journey and of the wisdom of all these cultures is this, he said, participate joyfully in the sorrows of the world. We cannot cure the world of sorrows, but we can choose to live in joy. The warrior's approach is to say yes to life, yea to it all. So I think let's, let's stop there and let that undo the negativity that I put out there before. Thank you.